Standing up in McKinney, this is According to Callus. I did, I did struggle with what I wanted to title this episode. You know, I, I typically do a McKinney Monday or just try and keep it local on Mondays. I think that's a huge value add to our community. So I'm going to go with <laughs> The Empire Strikes Back or Struck Back if you prefer so I don't steal the title. The Empire Struck Back. <sighs> and I will do the best I can to explain and make sense and hopefully, hopefully leave you with a little bit of a positive outlook at the end. With that, before I get into the subject du jour of the day, let me remind you, I'm asking for your help. I need you to do me a solid, like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. Follow me on your social media or podcatcher of choice. I am on uh, all the podcatchers. It's according to Callus. It's very easy to find. I have a uh, Facebook group and a page, according to Callus. I am a pro at Gab. I drop in at MeWe. And, uh, you know, probably in the next week or two, I, I've got some changes I'm going to have to start unfolding uh, to make sense of how do I do this going forward. But that being said, for now, that's what I need you to do. That's all I'm asking for. Not asking for your money, not asking for really any time other than whatever you commit to listen to the program, presumably while you're driving about your day. And if you listen at a quicker than normal speed, like most people that listen to podcasts, I'm done in 20 minutes. And there's a whole lot of stuff you can do beyond that. So with that, let's get into the subject of the day. Okay, so there are a... um, number of posts, a number of uh, complaints, and maybe some takeaways from the results of the runoff. Now, let me first preface this by saying this is all going to be gut reaction. I've spoken to none of the players. Uh, Even knowing three of the four candidates in the Allen runoff, I I haven't talked to any of them yet. It's just going to be straight up gut reaction. I don't know uh, anything about the uh, Anna race. Although apparently the person that was uh, running under the banner of the Republican Party's endorsement did win. That's great. Um, Further, I think I want to frame this in such a way that the the folks that were going to be uh, downers will see a way forward. The folks that are, let's say, happy with the results we'll have it put in perspective and quite frankly hopefully this will cause people to reconsider whether or not there is really a truly a value add if you're not going to be strategic with your endorsements now i know this is kind of a touchy subject and people uh, disagree on this from time to time and that's okay you're allowed to disagree that is one of the fringe benefits of being a republican right <laughs> you you're not expected to be in lockstep all right so let's 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 get to the thing here all right so both the incumbents and allen lost and it was a significant loss in percentage but in real numbers it's nothing. We're talking less than a thousand votes. And I'm going to do some quick math just to demonstrate how silly this whole thing is. So we're going to use round numbers and I know they're not accurate. So please spare me. Okay. There's a hundred thousand people in Allen. And I know there's not, but just go with me here. 50,000 of them are registered voters. We're, we're just going to say that off the bat. Okay. So 50,000 registered voters. Now, of that 50,000 registered voters, roughly 4,000 people showed up, which would be, what, 9% of the voting population. Now, I've heard numbers that 4% of that was the Democrat Party, and I'm not sure because it was there's a lot of information that's rolled about. I'm not sure if that 4% was the Democrat Party's influence in the runoff or the primary, or if it was the uh, presence in the runoff for this election. 
I, I don't really know. And when you say only 4% showed up and you've got a, let's call it a 65-35 spread. And I know that's not entirely accurate, but <clears throat> we're just going to go with two thirds. Okay, fine. 66-33, right? So you got a 66-33% spread. And if you throw 4% on that, that still leaves it at 62%. So that doesn't look terrible, but I don't think that's really what the number is. What I'm thinking is 4% of all Democrats showed up. Or if we take the numbers that we used before, we're going to say 50,000 voters. And we're going to say that Allen is roughly 60-40 Republican Democrat, just for argument's sake, right? So we're going to jump our number back up to 100,000. We're going to say there's 40,000 Democrats. And when you cut that in half, it's 20,000, right? So you've got 30,000 Republicans, 20,000 Democrats. And, and look, I fully am aware these are not accurate numbers. I'm just trying to game this out with you, okay? So if you have 20,000 Democrat voters and 4% of that 20,000 shows up, what is that? Sounds like about 800 voters, be my guess. 800 votes out of a 4,000, well, I think it was only, let me think, it was 1,800, I think it was 3,500 people showed up. I, I think that's right. So if you s subtract 800 votes from the winner, right? 800 votes away from a person that won their election with two thirds, which, and we're going to, again, we're going to use round numbers because that's what we need to do. We're going to say it's 2000 to 1200. Again, the numbers are not accurate. Just go with me here. If I take away those 800 votes that all went to the, let's call them the more moderate candidate. Now you're looking at a 1200, 1200 turnout, or that's, pretty sad, right? The Democrats controlled the outcome of that election. Now, what's more sad is the Republicans should have known this flat out. They should have been well aware of that. They should have been more cautious. Now, when I say the empire struck back, what do I mean? Well, as you're well aware, a good number of our large cities in Collin County, they have a Let's call them the establishment, the uniparty, what, what, whatever it is you prefer, whether it's pejorative or not, they have their city fathers, right? They're, they're uh, ruling oligarchy, right? They don't like anybody that gets in there and questions what they're doing. And I got to be honest, a lot of times, most cities that are nominally red are run by what I would call a benevolent dictatorship. That is, they get theirs, and they usually get theirs over and above whatever anybody else gets, but on the whole, the city benefits, and everybody generally has a positive outcome. And if I compare Allen to Plano, you can see some of that. Plano is d definitely more purple, de definitely maybe even full-on blue at this point, and Allen's significantly a nicer city, and it's run better. We can see that, Right. And I mean, even if you compare Allen to McKinney, there's a lot of things Allen does better, in my opinion, than McKinney. Now, maybe it's a fair comparison. Maybe it's not. I mean, it's much smaller geographically. The population is about half. Um, they have a, let's say, a little bit better corridor on 75 that they were able to develop to offset the costs. So there's pluses and minuses. Plus, they, they have the entire south side of 121 from Custer to 75 which was undeveloped and is now being developed and looks to be they're putting a little more thought in it than just apartments. Again, some of that is driven by the city council. A lot of it is driven by the, the people that run the city, the, the people that are behind the scenes that make the big decisions that float their ideas to the city council that are expecting rubber stamps or a pat on the head. And they've, they control the zoning boards. They control all these things. And that's fine insofar as the city actually benefits from it. 
But when you're picking winners and losers and when you're subsidizing bad investments and you're really spending foolish money on fixing things that weren't broke in the first place, one questions whether or not there was wisdom in that. So when I think about, you know, three years ago when we got Dave, Dave and Darren, the tenor changed, right? It went, uh, I would say, more fiscally conservative for sure. Certainly they were talking a little bit more about social issues insofar as how they were applied at the city level. But I really was at a loss as to why they were referring to these guys as being right wing and only dealing with the right wing and only hardcore. I mean, I never saw any of this. Now, granted, I do not live in Allen, Texas. I don't know all the details. And from the outside looking in, it looked like the status quo was pretty much maintained with a slight shift to the right on the Overton window. Now, as a Republican, as somebody that's interested in how these cities are being run, to me, that seems like the best way to do things, right? We want to get our folks elected. We want to make sure they do a really good job. And we want to shift that Overton window slightly to the right. So then you got to ask yourself, well, what happened here? Okay. Now, again, I have no secret background information here. I don't know all the details. Most of this is pure speculation. So you had a very effective, well-run grassroots organization that ran the board, got three candidates across the finish line three years ago, um, didn't quite get it done the last go round because there was a defection uh, and a, not just a defection, a number of defections. And they, they fractured their grassroots organization over this. Now, some of that was driven by a split over congressional candidates. Some of it was just split probably over ego would be my guess. And again, I'm not pointing fingers because I don't know. This is all speculation. So that leads us to where we're at now. So they effectively have, let's call them the less. Boy, I want to be careful how I phrase this because again, I, having some knowledge and some interaction with one of the uh, candidates that won and knowing him somewhat personally. And again, I want to be clear. I don't dislike the guy. I don't think negatively of him as a person. I'm not sure that I approve of how this all played out, but then again, they didn't really ask me. <laughs> They're not really concerned about what I think. So that being said, <sighs> there, every Democrat is unhappy all the time with anybody that's not leftist. That's a given, right? So if you get somebody that's a little bit further to the right than dead on middle or a little bit more center right than what some Republicans or the oligarchy is comfortable with and the Democrats approach them and say, hey, look, just run some middle of the road people. They're nice and we'll support them because we want to get rid of these guys. And the empire says, well, you know what? We're not real thrilled with them either. We've been having to work with them and cut them deals, but man, if we can cut them out with your support, yeah, of course, we'll do it. And then they go approach some of those people that caused or were, oh boy, cause is probably harsh. Let's say we're involved in the former grassroots organization that was previously well-run and highly effective. And when they splintered off, they went and approached these folks. Now, did that happen prior to the splinter or after the splinter? I don't know. Maybe the two are completely separate. I don't know. You go approach these guys and say, hey, look, we know you have an interest in these things. And, oh, we've got one of these guys we dusted off that did a good job in the past. We think we can get them across the finish line. You want to come and join us. So the, the folks that were, you know, maybe a little ambitious, maybe weren't as hard, quote unquote, right as the other folks. Said, well, yeah, we can do this and we, we can get our own people in there and, you know, we can, we can get a seat at the table. Okay, so you see how this plays out, right? So the empire knows that the way they win is to keep the right, and I would even say center to the right, separated. Because they, most of the time, are generally in the center. Because they just want what pays them. What, what lines their pocketbook. I mean, a lot of this is driven by money. And let's be honest, a lot of these guys already have tons of money as it is. 
So I'm not really sure what the concern is other than they don't want to lose it or they don't want to face competition. I mean, what else are we to conclude? So they get behind, they push, they cut the deal with the Democrats. The Democrats get what they want, which is people more agreeable to what it is they want. The, the empire gets what they want, which is people that they control. Maybe that's too strong a word. People that they can quote unquote work with. And then the city councils drift back into sleep, right? They just rubber stamp what comes before them. And as long as it looks even nominally positive, they don't question it. So if that's all that was going on, most of us would probably tolerate this quite well. But the result of this is they didn't get rid of a crazy left winger. They didn't get rid of some crazy lunatic right wing person, which is how I saw some of the messaging was done. No, they got rid of guys that are center right. Or maybe, maybe you could make the argument that hard, hard right center, right? The, these guys are not, you know, the wackadoos that some would per, portray. I, in fact, I to be honest, I never really saw any of that in the marketing. But again, I live in McKinney. I'm not intimately involved with what goes on in Allen. I did go interview the guys I thought were good and I wanted to see when. I did endorse them for what it's worth. And... They still lost. And one had an endorsement from the Republican Party of Collin County, and the other decided it wasn't worth the trouble that it might bring with it. And what's interesting to me is the one that had the endorsement actually got fewer votes. Now, is that a result of the endorsement, or is that just something that was baked in already? I don't know. But again, the Empire struck back. The Empire knew what the gameplay was here because it happens every single time. The center, the moderate middle, sells out the right every chance they get to because they think they're buying peace or they think they're getting a deal to keep their leftists under control. We, we just throw them a bone every now and again. They don't do that for the folks on the right. In fact, they, they spend all their time disdaining and dismissing the people on the right. And I don't know if that's because there's no fear or if I don't know, it's because they know the right's just going to run their mouth and maybe they'll move. But they're, they're legitimately concerned about the leftists because leftists do things. Leftists burn buildings. Leftists tear down statues. Leftists sabotage. Leftists protest. Le leftists destroy nice cities. They just do. So perhaps it's looking at it from the point of view that if we can just buy off the progressive libs here and get them to settle down and stay in their own lane, we'll keep peace in our city. I mean, and to an extent that that may be true, I can get it. I don't approve, but I, I can get it. So what does that mean? One, the right, the conservatives, the Republicans, the Christians, whatever, they need to understand that we can't win without the moderate middle. Now, the moderate middle has shown that they have no problem throwing us under the bus. But they also need to know we're going to be more agreeable to work with them and we're going to be on more equal footing with them than the crazy leftists are. But see, they don't think they're dealing with the crazy leftists. They think they're dealing with the, you know, the moderate center left people. And maybe they are. Maybe that's the only people they actually deal with. Maybe. But you got to ask yourself, how did we get here? It's because we don't use enough strategy. We don't put enough thought into it. Most cities, by definition of a city, are at best moderate. You can have a small to medium-sized city that stays right moderate. When they get to be large and they're basically mass groups of people, they tend to go center left or full left. Look at Dallas. Look at what's going on in Fort Worth. It, it, in college towns, look at Denton. I mean, this is something we have to contend with. You can't just come in and bash them and say they're terrible or they're crazy leftist, progressive, socialist, whatever. You have to offer an attractive alternative. You have to say, we want those things, but we want to go about getting them in a different way. We want 
peace, but we want to do it in a good way. And honestly, I don't really have any fault or any harsh critique of the Daves. I thought they did a decent job. I thought they did a lot of things right. Were there some errors? Yeah. Were there some things that they maybe could have done a little differently? Sure. And that's going to be seen in hindsight. But at the time, it looked reasonable. It looked fair. Now, could there have perhaps been some better media campaign? Could there have been some more help? Yeah, maybe. But again, the most effective means for them to win re-election, that is the highly effective, well-led grassroots organization, had been damaged, severely damaged, which allowed the empire to strike back. Now, what does this mean? <sighs> the moderates, they always feel slighted. They, and, they, and they have good reason to, in many cases, by the right. The right dismisses them. They deal with them with disdain. They look down upon them. They, they, they call them names, whether it's rhino or whatever. It doesn't matter. We're just as bad as they portray us to be in many cases, because we want to hold ourselves up as better. We are the principled ones. We want, we want to do these things and we're right and you're wrong. But the fact of the matter is they're supposed to be on our team. We want them on our team. We can't win without them. And if we spend all of our time pissing off the moderates, this is what we get. This is the response. The moderates say, well, okay, fine. We're going to go cut a deal with the Democrats because they're 40% of the vote or maybe even 45% of the vote. And while we would win if we stayed with you guys. We're not right enough for you. We're not conservative enough for you. Uh, we'll just kind of deal with them. I uh, I got to believe most moderates are, you know, they're not wanting confrontation. That's part of the issue, right? They just want to go along to get along. They just want to keep things nice and peaceful. And I don't blame them for that. But if you're not offering a good alternative and you're not articulating it well, they have no reason to stick with you. They feel slighted. They feel abused. Now, it is a two-way street. The moderates knuckle under the slightest bit of pressure. They, they cave on things that they should never cave on. They, they cave and give in on things that are legitimately good, true, and positive, and that they should hold the line no matter what, and they don't. And that's very frustrating to a good, hardcore, conservative person. They get upset. They get bent out of shape. But rather than handling it like an adult and reaching out to them, privately and discussing it how can we do this better or why did you feel the need to do this they just slam them and they attack them and if you don't believe me look at what happened in our you know primaries now look i've been honest the whole time i am not a big fan of the representative hd67 but in no way, shape, or form do I think he's ineffective. In no way, shape, or form do I not think he is very slick and well put together. And in no way, shape, or form do I not think he is going to keep th that seat for a very long time. Especially after the crushing defeat that went down. And again, you can blame the Democrats. And to be sure, they paid, played a huge part in that. At least psychologically. But at the end of the day, it's our own responsibility. We got to remember who's on our team and we got to treat them like teammates. Yeah, you can get upset with your teammate, but the time to ball them out, the time to be upset with them is after the game is over and you're driving home. You don't beat them up while they're on the field. You don't attack them when they're on the field. You don't belittle them and, and create a fight that you don't need to. Now, look, in the case of the guy that's in HD 67, I think he enjoys it. I, I think he gets to elevate himself up off of that. I think that's one of the reasons why he's been so successful is he's doing the triangulation strategy that Bill Clinton did so well. Do I think the guy's Bill Clinton? Uh, no. The jury's probably out on that. Certainly got some similarities there in my opinion. But the idea is they're on our team. And while we can critique them, and maybe go after them in a primary. As soon as that primary is over, it's our job to line up behind them and say, well, you won. we got to get you across the finish line. Yeah, and then this time around, we really, we want to make peace. If you can deliver on these couple of three things here, or um, if you help us achieve these goals, you know, we're going to be good. It'll all be good. We're going to bury the hatchet. But the thing is, elected officials don't necessarily look at it that way. Indeed, 
The empire doesn't look at it that way. While conservative activists might be content with that or they might be all right with that, a lot of them are not. They hold the grudge too. It's politics. The grudges are what's killing us. So, in addition to that, we you remember I referred to the Overton window, right? That's the acceptable conversation. That's what is on the table, things that can be discussed. I think the Overton window did get pushed in now. I, I think it's been moved and it's not going to right away be pushed back. I believe that at least one of the two guys that got elected, even though I didn't support them, I, I don't hate them. And one of them I know, uh, they're not a doubt in my mind more center than the other two. But on the other side, at least one of them is a Republican is by his definition conservative. I don't think that it's the end of the world. I don't think it's a disaster. But what does that mean going forward? Right? I mean, that's at the end of this discussion. What's your takeaway? I think we still get the Overton window. The major takeaway is you have to know your enemy. We have to remind the moderates, right? The, those milk toast conservatives. We have to remind them that the less the leftist, progressive, socialist Democrats are our common enemy. When and if they should ever get any power or authority, they will unleash everything on all of us. And as milk toast moderates, you might be able to stay under the radar for a while. You, you might be able to tolerate it for a while. But then you end up with Austin or Dallas or Houston. And is that what you really want? Because that, that's ultimately what's going to happen if you continue to side with them and help these folks. Now, yes, we as conservatives, we as the right wing, we as Christians, we have certain expectations. We have certain things that we want done. And we hold the line and we hold you accountable for that. Yes. But we, when I say we, because I include myself with this because I'm not perfect. Sometimes I slip too. Our enemy are not the milk toast moderates. Our enemy is, again, the same leftist progressive socialists. We need to remind ourselves that. And if you, if it helps you, consider your milk toast moderates as your weaker brother or your weaker, weaker brotheren, to be more appropriate. They're on our team. They're with us, but they just don't have what it takes to push back, hold the line, and fight the fight like, quote unquote, we do. And not everybody's me and not everybody's you if you're listening to me. Everybody has their thing. Everybody has their strengths and their weaknesses. You got to remember those milk toast moderates, they still have to show up and vote. Those very same people that you look down in disdain because they don't hold the same values or principles that you do, they agree with us on the vast majority of the stuff. We need to remind them that we're on the same team. We need to treat them like they're on the same team. We need to not attack them more than we attack the leftist progressive socialists because they will realize that perhaps we're acting more like an enemy than those leftist progressive socialists. Those left, leftist progressive socialists, they know all the right things to say. They have worm tongues. They're particularly good at telling people what they want to hear and what they need to hear. And they'll sell those moderates out in a heartbeat as soon as they get into power but they're going to come after us first. So we need to be sure that we hold the center. We need to be sure that those folks know we're, we're not their enemy. Yeah. Okay. We don't agree on everything. Okay. You're not my favorite flavor of Republicanism. That's fine, but we're still on the same team. You guys will be in a world of hurt if you don't work with us and we can't win without you. Because every time you don't show up or worse yet, you show up and help the leftist progressive socialists or you let them help you, you're selling yourself out. Now, here's here's the light at the end of the tunnel. You've now learned this. You saw it play out. You have time to dust off your pants, your boots, and walk on to the next race. We will be prepared. We're going to need to work on our marketing. We're going to need to work on our messaging. We're going to need to work on our candidates. And we're going to need to work on a strategy. 
Those are all knowns. Those are all things that we knew going in, but we took what we had. And I don't blame anybody. Not any one person is responsible for the outcome of what's happened in this entire election cycle. And one last thing I want to throw out here. This has been the election that has not ended. It is June 15th and we're finishing runoffs. For six months, we've been campaigning and fighting amongst ourselves. First in the primaries, then in the municipals, then in the primary runoffs, and now in the municipal runoffs. And we've been fighting amongst ourselves without remembering who the enemy is. What's done is done. I know there's a whole lot of folks that are disappointed. I get it. I really do. I feel for you because that's me too. I'm disappointed. We, we took the wins we could get. We suffered some tough losses, but even some of those tough losses are not huge losses. And, and I want to get personal here for just a second. And, and I mean this in all sincerity. And, and I'm going to quantify it in the best way I know how, and it's not fair. And it's, and it's clearly subject to interpretation or somebody that knows better. But if you live in the city of Allen and you accept that the city of Allen on a scale of one to 10, 10 being hardcore right wing conservative and zero being leftist progressive socialist, in my mind, the city of Allen's about a 5.5 or a six at best, at best. And the city of Allen previously had three guys, Darren, Dave, and Dave, that were probably sevens or eights. Maybe you could make an argument 8.5 for one of them, Right. They really pushed that Overton window. And for the three guys that won, honestly, at least two of them are going to be 5.5. They just are. The other guy, I'm going to be gracious. And I'm going to say, the guy's probably a seven. Now, would I have preferred the eight or the 8.5 to was facing off against them? Sure. But is a seven that big of a loss? What's really going to happen is what happens when the council meets together, because the biggest danger, the biggest fear I have is when you've got a city council that everybody's in lockstep, nobody questions anything, nobody dares to look at what's going on and everybody just signs off and rubber stamps everything that comes down. And honestly, you're going to get a whole lot of that when you're dealing with anything from a 4.5 to a seven. It's just going to happen. They're not going to fight the fight. They're afraid of the empire and rightfully so. The empire won the day. The Empire's won the day the last two election cycles, at least in the city of McKinney. The Empire won the day in Frisco. You cannot fight a head-up battle with the Empire and expect to win. You just can't. But you can win, and you can take those battles one at a time and pick away and push back and move the line. And that's what we got to do. There is no knockout blow. No long-term knockout blow strategy wins forever because they'll find a way to counter it. They'll find a way to take back and they've done it and they've done it successfully. And until we remember that and until we use our heads, we're not going to be able to overcome it. But all is not lost. There is a way forward. You just got to remember who your enemy is. With that, Went a little long. This is according to Callus. It is Monday, right? 617, the year of our Lord, 2024. And with that, I will see you on the other side.